Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord of glory forever. Amen. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the Son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons, except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. <clears throat> the reading of uh, today's liturgy focuses on the undivided heart. As we have seen in the, uh, the Pauline readings and in the Book of Acts, it's talking about bringing people together, the unity of the church, the Jews and the Gentiles. And in the Catholic one, it was talking about the double-minded men in the church. And we will see that the uh, one of the key verses in today's gospel is that any kingdom that's divided cannot stand. And today's reading, what's in the very beginning of the gospel was this blind and mute man who was brought to Jesus. And he was demon-possessed. And the interesting part is that when Jesus wanted to heal him, he did not make him see or start to speak. But what he did, he casted out the demon. And just by casting out the demon, the man started to uh, speak again and to see again. So the question today, it's kind of silly. It sounds like a silly question. Are you demon-possessed? But there are modern ways of being demon-possessed. Even the, the old-fashioned, the old days, it's very obvious. But in today's world, the definition of <laughs> demon-possessions in our life, we can ask this question in a different way. If there are any rooms any areas in our hearts that are controlled by the demon, that we have no control over. God has no control over. He's not allowed to get in. It's a dark room. 
in our life that we are not in control and God is not in control. All things are lawful for me. That's what St. Paul was saying. All things are lawful or are permissible to me. In Christianity, we don't have this is right, this is wrong. You cannot do this. There's a lot of freedom in Christianity. Everything is lawful. But as long as it will not brought me under its power. As long as it does not destruct my life or the life of others. There's a story about, it's uh, one of those uh, very old stories, but very relevant till today, about um, a man named Goha. And that man, he wanted to sell his house. He wanted to make some money, and he want, so he put his house for sale. And he got an offer, and he made a deal that he's going to sell his house. But he said, I'm, I'm going to give you all the property, the whole house, except there's one thing that's dear to me. There's a nail on that wall that I'm going to uh, keep possession of that nail. You get the whole house. But I'll just, uh, I will own just that one nail in the wall, one of the internal walls in the house. And the guy was a good deal. He said, okay, yeah, that's fine. They closed on the house and everything went fine. Uh, he took possession of the house. Few days after closing, he heard a knocking on the door. Opened the door, he found Goha uh, saying, excuse me, I, I just need to make sure that the the nail is in its place and it's fine. It just because this is a very precious nail to me, so I just want to uh, spend some time with my nail. I said, okay. He went in and I spent a few hours with the nail and uh, got out. Next day, at uh, very late at night, at midnight, he hears some knocking on the door again. Open the door, find Goha. And Goha tells him, uh, excuse me, because I, I just missed my nail. I want to get in. I want to just uh, spend some time with the nail again. He said, no, you cannot do this to me. It's, it's, it's midnight. It's my kids are sleeping. You cannot get in. He said, contractually, I own the nail, and I, I should have access to the nail any time I want. He said, yeah, contractually, by contract, you can. You should. So he got in. He, he got in. Uh, and that went on and on for for a long time. One time, Goha shows up with, uh, he, he told him, I got married, and this is my wife, I want to show her the nail. One time, and the whole family is coming to spend some time with the nail. Before they know it, they just, he almost occupied the whole house with his family every once in a while, and, and, and the guy couldn't, couldn't uh, take it anymore. So the owner, the new owner of the house, he just, he got fed up with the whole thing, and he took the, the nail out of the wall, gave it to, to Goha and told him, I don't want to see you again, here's your nail. And Goha looked at the nail and was like, yeah, now I have the nail outside, I, can, I don't have anything on this house anymore. And um, they, 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 uh, they were happy ever after. So the moral of the story is that it doesn't matter how small that room is in, in the heart. It doesn't matter how we, th we think how small is the sin, or how small is that area in our life. But Satan will have an opportunity to get in and control our life, and control our life. So it's just an aim, but it gave, it gave control to, um, to the whole house. So the, the people who are living in the house were no longer uh, in control of their own house. There's one of those t-shirts that we see once in a while, the property of Jesus. Property of Jesus. And this is what we're supposed to be. We are supposed to be a property of Jesus. We, he owns 100% of what we have. And all our life is owned by him. And we enter into that covenant. We enter with, with this covenant with Jesus when we had all the, all the Mayroon crosses on our bodies, in our thoughts, and in our prayers with him, we give him 
all our life. So the question today is, is there anything in our heart that does not belong to him? Is our heart divided on its own? There are many examples of today modern demon possession. There is, uh, I know, some friends who kind of, they, they, in order to eat some food, they, it has to be in a certain time, certain, uh, it has to be hot, and, and there's some, a lot, a lot of addiction about food around us. As small as it is, as silly as it could be, but it could be making us blind and mute, like the guy who saw earlier in the gospel. The guy was mute, and blind and, and, and he couldn't enjoy many of the things in life because of he was demon possessed and, 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 and demons when they take control they, they, they cause destruction. Coffee is another, another area of, of, uh, of control. I, I, I know another, another friend who, who once told me that he cannot attend the, the late liturgy he, he started to, to be like that because he cannot skip the coffee in the morning. And he's, he was working on that. So kind of, and he kind of was encouragement to me that I, I can see him working on something. He was telling me that I'm working on this because it's now I get the headache. I, I need to kind of, uh, uh, I like coffee in the morning, but it's not going to control me and make me uh, blind or mute to other blessings uh, that I could receive from God. There are, the money addict, there's, there's the, 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 the demon possession in, in terms of money. Is, is, are my decisions during the day, throughout the day, are controlled by my values and my uh, commitment to God, or are driven by the money and how much I can save or how, how much I can make? It is very good to, to be um, financially literate and all this kind of stuff. But that does not take possession on uh, the life or the heart. There is the, uh, the, the alcohol, ad alcohol addictions. There is the sex addictions, the pornography addiction. There's some shocking statistics out there. One of the statistics that I heard recently, um, about the statistic maybe were a couple of years old, that 86%, they did a survey in a, in a college, and 86% 80, of that college, they were addicted or, or some, somehow uh, attracted to pornography. I'd like to point out that there are 14% were pure, uh, but it was shocking that only 14% were pure. The relationships addicts, relationships addicts, makes others to control our lives, pleasing people, and that's another kind of addiction. We know about uh, Samson in the Old Testament and Delilah, how he lost everything uh, by being addict to one relationship with a woman. And we know Solomon, the, 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 the wisest man on earth, who ever lived on earth, uh, he was a woman addict too. And and he almost lost it until he repented toward the end of his days. TV addicts. There is some houses that um, have the TV on 24-7, kind of like it has to be on. And uh, it takes from the family time. It takes from other time. It takes from prayer time. It takes from a lot of energy out of the house. There is the, the games. And there's, there's a lot of statistics there. There's as, as small things as like that, but it, it, it makes, it destructs. It causes destructions in life. Uh, there's some other statistics in college that people can uh, be very smart students, but when they get into some other uh, habits, they just start to uh, uh, lag in, in, their, in their grades and and just because a small nail in the house, they give control over their whole life. Friends addicts, uh, some people, they just don't have their own minds. They, they have to please their friends, and, and friends are more important than their values. Praise addicts, if I don't get praised, we're not going to do it. 
It has to be uh, in a certain prestigious way to do stuff. Otherwise, uh, that takes control over our life. And the list goes on and on. One of the, um, one of the paper um, that I came across, that they, they were doing some classification of the addiction in the 20th century, 21st century, and they were saying that there was 200 addictions, 200 different types of addiction that can control one's life and uh, take away control from God and from what we are supposed to be doing. Property of Jesus. We are the property of Jesus. And you might say, what's the big deal? It's just a name. It's just a cup of coffee. It's just this picture or whatever that is. But the gospel today tells us that every kingdom divided, divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. A divided heart is a broken heart. A divided heart will not find peace and will not find enough passion and energy to live life uh, as it's supposed to be. And in Ephesians, St. Paul tells us, do not give the devil a foothold, or in other translation, do not give the devil an opportunity, or a place, or a room. Do not give the devil a foothold in your heart. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Do not let sin reign. Because when sin gets in, it tries to reign. It tries to get, take over, take control, even if it's just one male. And when it comes in, the goal is not the addiction. The goal is destruction. Satan does not seek control just for, for the, the fun of the control. But he seeks control to steal and to kill and to destroy. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. If you have ever uh, bought uh, a property in the United States, you heard about the, the title, insurance. When you buy the house, you want to make sure that when you get possession on the, on the house, it's really yours, and there's no liens on the house. There's no one else has any claim on the house. So probably it's, you, you pay about thousands of dollars as a title insurance part of the mortgage process, to make sure that the, the possession on the house is clean and it's clear. And there's no one has any uh, questions about the possession of, on the house. So the, the question again, are we giving Jesus a clear title on our heart, and a clear title as a property of Jesus? Are we giving him a clean and a clear title that he possesses everything everything in our life and everything in our heart. Or still some people have some claims over this room or this area of our heart. Again, all things are lawful, but nothing will brought me under uh, their power. The good news is that we have a promise that if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. And when Jesus was given the book of Isaiah to read in the, uh, in the synagogue one of the, those days, he, turned, he opened the book and this verse came to Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus was trying to tell all his people. He said that I was sent to heal the brokenhearted, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set a liberty at liberty those who are oppressed. And talk about all those addictions and all those uh, habits that take us away from God. God is, is, is promising that he can set us free. That's his whole message. 
That's his own work in us. He, he tells us that, give me the chance, and this is my business, this is my work. I set people free. I set people, this is what I do. For the brokenhearted, for the oppressed, for the captives, I set those free. That's my job. You look at the whole list, and maybe it's not just one nail, maybe it's many nails in our life. But we have those promises that Jesus, if he sets us free, we will be free indeed. So how to extract those nails and how, how to cast those demons out of our, those hidden rooms, dark rooms in our hearts? Mer Isaac the Syrian has a, a very profound meaning. And when he say here, if anyone thinks Anyone who thinks that there is a door to repentance or to freedom other than prayer, he or she is deceived by the devil. This is one of the devil's trick. When we start to say, yeah, I want to repent, what are you going to do? What's the door for repentance? The devil could trick us to say, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to promise this, I'm going to... Uh, there's all kind of tricks. He can come up with many ideas bouncing in our minds, how to repent. But here, Mayor Isaac the Syrian is telling us, those are all tricks. There's only one way, only one door to repent, is to go on your knees into your room and through prayer, you pray. And we're going to talk on what to pray and what to say. But the main door, the only door for repentance is the prayer. And like Jesus was saying, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. This is the Sunday school common answer. How we conquer the devil, how we receive victory, always prayer and fasting. And it's so true. I am glad that we all know it. But when is going to be the time that we all do it? Because this is the, 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 the biggest trick that can, the devil can trick us into, is to try to repent with so all other ways. But we don't pray and we don't fast. The guy who was mute and was blind, he got healed by casting out the demon. And casting out the demon only happened by prayer and fasting. So if you want to open your eyes, if you want to open your ears, your mouth, your senses, you want to really see Jesus, you want to really have a relationship with Jesus, casting those dem demons out of those dark rooms, the only way, the only door is prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. How are we doing in our prayer life? How are we doing when a fast comes along? Steps to freedom. Like we said, we only have two steps, two things to do. Prayer and fasting. And when we pray, we tell Jesus, we ask him of those three things. Reveal to me all the nails, all those dark rooms. So the first prayer is to ask God to show us where are the nails. Show us all those bad habits and to convict us. And the second thing is to help us to admit it and take full responsibility and to confess it. So it's not other people's problems, it's not other people's uh, mistakes that we are doing what we're doing. It's our own mistake. We own it. We, ha we take full responsibility of it. And we pray to God. We stand in front of God and tell him if we want to repent. That's the, that's the way that Isaac and Jesus was telling us. The door is the prayer. And what to pray is to pray for Jesus to show us our sins. Show us all those dark rooms. And to help us to confess it and to admit it and to take full ownership of it and to ask him, obviously, to heal it. 
to heal it and to set us free so we can be free indeed. And what happens is usually after those prayers and this type of uh, admission of sins, what happens is the passion in the heart starts to be replaced from one passion with another passion. Instead of being passionate about certain things that control us and we, we have to do every day or every whatever, it becomes a passion, a more passion for freedom, for real freedom, a more passion to be more closer to Jesus. And that's the whole um, uh, reason why there, there's only one door, which is the prayer, because we receive that power only through God and only through Jesus. And there's no other way to receive that except from Him. And God has His own ways of setting us free and sending us and giving us this passion, replacing passion with, a, with another passion. And with fasting, the church always has a purpose with every fast. We don't have to have we, uh, our own uh, uh, days of fasting because the church already has lots of fast. If we know the Coptic church, we have no shortage of fasting in our church. And sometimes we complain about it, but if we understand it, we will have a purpose in fasting. It's a door for casting demons. I'm talking about the demons in our life, in our heart. So we take advantage of any fast. There's every Wednesday there is a fast. Every Friday there is a fast. November 25th, we're going to start a new fasting for 43 days. So when we pray about those fastings, and God starts to show us more and more, and Gary had set us free of this, We'll set us of the second one, the third, the fourth, the fifth. And the, God, the, the, the heart start to be undivided, start to be only a whole heart. It, the fast will come and we'll put a purpose to that fast. And God will show us this. I want you to work on this during this coming fast. This coming Wednesday, work on this. This, this Friday, I'm going to work on this. And we pray for it, fast for it. And God has its own way, after we do that, to cast out the demons. If we think there's another way, it's, it's a trick. We are deceived. We can start today in the liturgy with David's prayer. This is one of the uh, very nice prayers that David has put in Psalm 139, 139. He was praying and saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He was asking God to show him, to reveal to him, to search his heart and his thoughts if there's any wicked way in the heart. And he was asking God to lead him in the way everlasting or for eternal life. May God give us the, to taste the joy and the power of undivided heart and the blessings and the joy and the peace that comes along with this undivided heart and to take us through this journey from being demon possessed to being a property of God with a clear title and with no nails. Glory be to God forever. Amen. We believe in one God, God the Father, the one Creator, Creator of heaven and earth, and all things seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages. 
light of light through God, through God, who God is not created, of one asking with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us man, for our salvation, came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and of the Virgin Mary, and became man. And he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried, and the third day 